In this video, we will look at the normal structure and function of blood vessels. We will begin by looking at the different classes of blood vessels. Arteries are vessels that carry blood away from the heart, regardless of how much oxygen is contained in the blood. People are often under the misconception that arteries carry only oxygenated blood. This is not the case. There are several arteries in the body that carry deoxygenated blood. The true definition of an artery is any vessel that carries blood away from the heart. Arterioles are the smallest branches of the arteries that go into the tissues. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels. This is where exchange occurs between the blood and the interstitial fluid. Venules then collect the blood from the capillaries and veins are vessels that return blood to the heart, again, regardless of how much oxygen is contained in the blood. The wall of a typical blood vessel can, may contain up to three different layers, the tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. The tunica intima is the innermost layer. This consists of an endothelial lining, which is a layer of simple squamous epithelial tissue, over a connective tissue layer. The innermost boundary of the tunica intima, which is shown right here, is called the internal elastic membrane. This separates the tunica intima from the next layer. The tunica media is the middle layer. This is made up of smooth muscle embedded in loose connective tissue. The inner boundary of the tunica media, right along here, is called the external elastic membrane. This separates the tunica media from the tunica externa. The tunica externa is the outermost layer. This is the connective tissue sheath that surrounds a blood vessel. One function of the tunica externa is to anchor the vessel to the adjacent tissues. The tunica externa has its own blood supply via small vessels known as the vasa vasorum. Literally translated, vasa vasorum means vessels of vessels. These are small arteries and veins found in the walls of the larger vessels. What they do is supply oxygen and nutrients to the tunica media and tunica externa while also removing waste products. We will look at the structure and function of the various vessels, beginning with the arteries. Arteries are vessels that are under extreme pressure. The elastic fibers that are found in the walls of the arteries allow them to absorb pressure waves that come with each heartbeat. Arteries also exhibit contractility. This function allows arteries to change their diameter. Contractility is controlled by the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. Vasoconstriction refers to when the smooth muscles contract due to stimulation by the autonomic nervous system. This will cause the diameter of the vessels to become smaller. Vasodilation refers to the relaxation of these smooth muscles. When a vessel vasodilates, the diameter will increase. Arteries run from the heart to the capillaries, and as they do so, they change from being elastic arteries to muscular arteries to arterioles. Elastic arteries are also known as the conducting arteries. Their job is to transport large volumes of blood away from the heart. These are some of the largest vessels in the body. Their tunica media has many elastic fibers compared to the number of muscle fibers. This makes them very resilient so that they can handle the increased pressure load. Examples of elastic arteries are the pulmonary trunk, aorta, and all their major branches. Muscular arteries are known as the distribution arteries. These are the medium-sized vessels in the body. Their tunica media has many more muscle cells compared to elastic fibers. Muscular arteries consist of most of the major arteries in the body. Arterioles are known as the resistance vessels. They are very small vessels with little or no tunica externa. They also have a thin or incomplete tunica media. 
They are known as the resistance vessels because they can change the diameter of their lumen. Changes in their diameter will have an effect on how much force will be needed by the heart in order to push blood through the system. Hence, this is why they are known as resistance vessels. An aneurysm is a bulge in an arterial wall caused by a weak spot in elastic fibers. Any increase in pressure in this area may end up rupturing the vessel. Next we have capillaries. Here, they contain no tunica media and no tunica externa. The diameter of a capillary is very similar to that of a red blood cell. Their walls are very thin and thus allow exchange to take place. They consist of an endothelial layer, which is simple squamous epithelial tissue, inside of a basal lamina. After the capillaries, blood will begin to move back toward the heart through the venous system. Blood will first enter into the venules. These are very small veins. Their job is to collect the blood from the capillaries. This type of vessel will lack a tunica media. Next are the medium sized veins. They have a thin tunica media with very few smooth muscle cells associated with it. Their tunica externa will have bundles of elastic fibers. Medium sized veins represent most of the veins in the body. And then lastly we have the large veins. Here we will find all three layers of the vessel wall. They have a relatively thick tunica externa, but a thin tunica media when compared to an artery of the same size. Examples of the larger veins are the vena cava and its branches. Veins are under very low pressure, but their job is to return blood to the heart. This can become very difficult, especially when we are standing and trying to return the blood from our lower extremities to the heart. To help with this process, the larger veins have valves in them. Valves are folds of the tunica intima. What they do is they prevent the blood from, from flowing backwards. The way this works is by using our skeletal muscles. When our skeletal muscles contract, they will compress on these larger veins. This will push the blood in those veins toward the heart and open the valve above that muscle. Once the muscles relax, the valve will close to prevent that blood from flowing backwards. When we look at the distribution of blood in the body, it is not evenly distributed between the arteries and the veins. The heart, arteries, and capillaries hold about 30 to 35 percent of the total blood volume. The venous system holds the other 60 to 65 percent, most of which is found in the larger venous networks. As a result, the venous system is known as, uh, as the capacitance vessels. Capacitance means the ability to stretch. It is the relationship between the blood vessel and blood pressure. For any given rise in blood pressure, veins can stretch about eight times that of an artery of the same size. Next we will look at some things that have an effect on pressure as well as resistance in the vascular system. Pressure and resistance will determine the blood flow and also the rate of capillary exchange. The total capillary blood flow is equal to the cardiac output and again this will be determined by pressure as well as resistance in the cardiovascular system. Pressure is the first concept to look at. The heart is responsible for generating pressure in, over, in order to overcome resistance in both the pulmonary and systemic circuit. This pressure is what will drive the blood through these circuits. When talking about pressure, there are three values that are often referred to. The first is blood pressure. Blood pressure is the pressure in the arterial system, and we measure this in millimeters of mercury. It begins at a high of about 100 millimeters of mercury at the beginning of the aorta and drops to about 35 millimeters of mercury at the beginning of the capillary beds. Next there is capillary hydrostatic pressure. This represents the pressure in the capillary beds. This begins at about 35 millimeters of mercury at the beginning of the capillary bed and drops to 18 millimeters of mercury at the end of the bed. 
Finally, there is venous pressure. This is the pressure in the venous system. This will be less than 18 millimeters of mercury. Resistance is what pressure needs to overcome in order to drive the blood through the vessels. Resistance, also referred to as total peripheral resistance, is the result of friction between the blood and the vessel walls and anything that will, will influence this friction. Total peripheral resistance depends on vessel length as well as diameter. In an adult, vessel length is constant, so this really doesn't come into play when in determining resistance. Vessel diameter, however, can vary by either vasodilation or vasoconstriction. For an example, as the diameter of a vessel decreases, or in other words, it vasoconstricts, the resistance will increase. Resistance also depends on the viscosity of the blood or thickness. Resistance is caused by molecules and suspended materials that are found in a liquid. Whole blood is about four times more viscous than water. The more viscous a material is, the slower it will flow and the more resistance it will generate. Turbulence will also affect resistance. Turbulence refers to the swirling action that uh, disturbs the smooth flow of a liquid. Any increase in resistance will slow down the flow. Turbulence typically occurs in the heart chambers and in the great vessels. Something else that could contribute to turbulence is atherosclerotic plaques. These will cause abnormal turbulence in any vessel that can, has one. All of these factors contribute to blood pressure. Normal blood pressure should be around 120 over 80. Hypertension is an abnormally high blood pressure, one that is greater than 140 over 90. Hypotension refers to an abnormally low blood pressure. And we said before that pressure in the venous system is very low, and yet the veins are responsible for returning blood back to the heart. So we need to look a little bit more at this venous pressure and venous return. This determines the amount of blood that will arrive at the right atrium each minute. Venous pressure is extremely low in the venous system. This low pressure and the resistance will be assisted by two factors. The first factor we looked at earlier, and this is muscle compression of the peripheral veins. Again, when the muscles contract, they will compress the blood vessels, pushing blood back to the heart through the one-way valves. Venous return also relies on the respiratory pump. This is the action of the thoracic cavity. When we inhale, this causes a drop in pressure in the thoracic cavity. When we exhale, the pressure in the thoracic cavity will be increased. Lastly, we need to look at the capillary pressure and how this affects exchange. Capillary pressure and exchange is vital to homeostasis. Materials can move through the capillaries via three mechanisms, diffusion, filtration, and reabsorption. Diffusion is the movement of ions from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. These materials include glucose, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and small ions such as sodium and potassium. In filtration, materials are forced out of the vessel due to higher pressures. These materials will be pushed through pores. Reabsorption is the result of osmosis. Capillary exchange in the form of filtration occurs at the arterial end of a capillary bed. The reason for this is the difference in pressures. At the beginning of the capillary bed, the capillary hydrostatic pressure inside the vessel is 35 millimeters of mercury. The osmotic pressure surrounding the vessel is 25 millimeters of mercury. The pressure difference will favor the movement of materials out of the blood vessels and into the surrounding interstitial spaces. So fluid and materials will move out of the capillary. These will then be picked up by the lymphatic vessels. Reabsorption occurs at the venous end of the capillary bed. Here now, pre uh, pressure differences will favor movement into the vessels. 
At the end of the capillary bed, the hydrostatic pressure is 18 millimeters of mercury inside of the vessel. The osmotic pressure surrounding the vessels is 25 millimeters of mercury. The pressure is higher outside of the vessels, so this will favor the reabsorption or the movement of materials back into the vessels. Capillaries end up filtering more than they are able to reabsorb. If nothing was done about this, excess fluid would begin to collect in the interstitial spaces. This excess fluid, though, will be picked up by the lymphatic vessels and returned to the blood vessels and to the heart.